Hi there. Welcome to Toronto's Festival of India on a virtual platform. So my name is Gopigita Shomakar and I am the Vice Principal of TKG Academy. This is the first school established by ISKCON's founder Acharya, Sri the Prabhupada. I'm also lucky to serve as the Regional Secretary for North America for the Ministry of Education. And so now that that's out of the way, here it is. We are having a festival online virtually because of this twilight zone type of atmosphere we all find ourselves in during COVID. And so that means that all of us, you and me included, are at home with our families more than we ever found imaginable. Our children are spending their days with us, whether it be during school time, most of us are now at summer break, and we still have to figure out how to get our work done. I'm sure that you have so many frustrating things that you're experiencing. I know I am, I know my friends are. How can we apply bhakti principles to the day-to-day -day situations and frustrations and circumstances we find ourselves in right now? And how can we implement those strategies immediately? So today I'm going to share with you just touching a little bit on two bhakti parenting principles. You can find more information on my website at gopigita.com. These two principles that you will learn are having high expectations and using blossoming words. So let's get started. Our bhakti philosophy teaches us that not only are our children intelligent, aristocratic, and transcendentalists from their previous lives, they are also intrinsically full of bliss, full of knowledge, so really smart, and eternal, which means they have a natural lust for life and vitality and action and energy. Sat, Chit, Ananda. In addition, the Bhakti scriptures state that, and I'm going to pull out some Sanskrit here, Jivere Svarupoi, Nitir Krishnadas. Our children and our students and our teenagers are automatically, naturally attracted to selfless service. They already have experienced the happiness of giving selflessly to someone else. And so knowing that as the basis for how we view our children helps when they act in ways that are contrary to that. And I know, because I am undergoing the same thing, that when you're home 24-7 with a bunch of three-year-olds and five-year-olds and eight-year-olds and defiant 14 and 18-year-olds, it can be extremely difficult to see your child as full of happiness, full of intelligence, and not depressed having a lust for life or eternal. So let me tell you a little bit of a story. There is, there was a professor. He was, he had just graduated from professor school, he had gotten his degree, and he was a rookie at a very well-known university. A rookie professor, his first year in, and he went to get his schedule, he was sharing his schedule of classes with a colleague. He had um, seen that he had five classes and one of them was section two. So he was talking to his friend, the colleague, and the colleague was like, what? You have the section two class? But wait a minute, section two is usually given only to really experienced professors. Why? Why would section two just be given to experienced professors? Because that's the section where all of the honors kids from a, around the state are um, a part of this section two class. Honors and AP kids, and they are so motivated and so intelligent that you have to really be on your toes and know what you're teaching in order to keep up with them. So this rookie professor thought, wow, this is quite an honor. 
I can do this. I'm going to teach this group of Section 2 students. The first day came and his first class came in and it was good, it was okay, he was nervous, he managed. The second class came in, that was all right as well. Now, mind you, he had five classes. And the third class happened to be the Section 2 honor students. And as soon as they walked in, he felt the energy shift. The way that they opened up their books, the answers, the way they shot up their hands, the deep, thoughtful answers they gave, the um, writing that they had completed, Completed. And day after day after day, he felt a great difference between the Section 2 class, the class of honor students, and the other four classes that he felt were just regular normal kids, high schoolers who were in their first year of college, who were just figuring out a new way of learning. And so, this professor found that he began to look forward to that class with all the honor students. He worked harder to prepare for it. And by the end of the semester, he was feeling so grateful that he had that group of students to keep him going through the ups and downs that edu every educator goes through. Um, right before Christmas, he went into the dean's office to say his goodbyes and check in, see how he was doing. And the dean's like, okay, what's up? How are you doing? How was your first semester in, in teaching? Like, tell me about it. And one by one, he began to explain all the differences between his Section 2 honors class and the other four classes he taught. And he explained how grateful he was. He exclaimed, thank you for giving me this opportunity, even though I'm a brand new teacher. And the dean was a little confused and he was like, okay, tell me about the differences between the section two and the other students that you're getting, between the AP honors kids and the other classes. And he began to share the differences. Their assignments are double. Their stack of assignments that they've turned in are double in length. Their essays, their work, double in the stack is higher by double all four of my other classes. As soon as I walk in, they are leaning forward. They are eager to hear what I have to say. They ask the most intelligent questions when, I, when I'm looking for feedback. The group environments are so collaborative. Everybody's speaking, everybody's thinking. Their projects are at such a high level. Everything they do is different than all four of my other students, other classes of students. And so the dean thought really thoughtfully, was very thoughtful for a while, and he paused and he said, you know what, uh, this year we canceled the Section 2 program. We had decided that we were going to sprinkle in the honor students across all of the classes, not just have one class with only honor students. We thought that was just healthier for our students in general to learn to collaborate with each other, no matter what their levels are. And our rookie teacher, our rookie professor, he was so confused. He left the dean's office in just a blur of thoughts and emotions. Is the dean trying to mess with me? Is he pulling my leg? And he began to call the different departments to find out, is this really correct? That section two with honors class students, did they change and cancel the program? And sure enough, one by one, everyone he called confirmed what the dean had said. There was no honors class of students coming in in the freshman year and there was no section two. This made him pause. Now what do you think happened here? What went wrong? Or rather, what went right? What was the difference in the five classes that this teacher, that this professor had made? And he had the entire Christmas break to think over it, I'm sure, because it was the first semester. This is a true story. Um, when he went home, he was considering this and thinking about it and looking at all of the work that his Section 2 students had completed versus the work that the others had completed. And he realized the only difference was him. He was the only one that changed the way that he interacted with those students. Everything he saw from the students was increasing his expectations and his 
idea of those students, everything. When they leaned forward, he took it as, oh, they're more interested. When they wrote, he took it as, oh, wow, they're so intelligent. When they discussed with each other, he was interested in what they had to say. They're smart kids. They're labeled as smart kids. They must have interesting things to say, even though it was just the same as every class. There was no difference between that class and the other class. It was the way his nonverbal communication, his body language, and his reactions to these students brought out the very best in them. And when he looked at their grades, Section 2's grades were by far much higher in comprehension, in understanding, in all the assessments than all the other classes and all the other students he was teaching. So this is what our Bhakti scriptures teach us. Jivera Svarupoi, Krishnera Nityadas. The intrinsic quality of a soul is to be a deep, beloved friend to the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Whether you call God the divine or the universe, or the divine energy, or Rama, or Krishna, or Jehovah. In our bhakti tradition, we call him Krishna, that all attractive one who maintains and plays with all of his friends, those of us souls who have left the spiritual kingdom, and each of us who have taken birth in a human form are intrinsically satchidananda, full of bliss, full of knowledge, and have a lust and vitality for life. In addition, we have a natural intrinsic desire to gain pleasure by serving others. And this is not just the case for us and for those all around us, for every living entity. This is very much the case for the children that we are in touch with every single day, whether it be your students, whether it be your youth group that you're responsible for, whether it be um, your own kids in your house, your snot-nosed two-year-old who can't seem to stop saying no to you, your, uh, what is it, noise, nose pointed upward, upturned nose, 13-year-old who can't seem to be around you and like they just want to get away from you because that's the stage of life they're in, whether they're crying over spilt milk or they're fighting over homework battles or chore battles, whatever they're doing, their identity, their intrinsic identity is Satchidananda, Jivera Svarupoi, Nitira, Krishnera Nityadas. And so let's put that frame of lens, put that lens on us, right? What does that mean? Like, say you're a seasoned, well-renowned cook, and people go in hordes, pay a lot of money to go to your restaurant, the restaurant where you cook, to eat the foods that you make. And everyone has the label of, wow, this person is such a renowned cook. He makes the best food, and I can't wait to taste his food. Say that that's your identity and one day you burn something and the smell of the smoke is coming out of the out of the oven what are the people around you going to act like how are they going to react are they going to reject you as a cook are they going to immediately deride you for oh my goodness how could you may deride yourself but are they going to immediately reject are you going to be written up in some newspaper where you had some good reviews of your cooking that oh my goodness they suck they fail don't go there anymore absolutely not because small mistakes in what our identity is and small steps to the contrary of identity here and there in small moments do not they do not mar who we, we really are. It's the same with children. As our children are growing, they're going to make many mistakes. They're going to have many days where they are very sad and do not know how to express happiness. They're going to have missteps in their academic journeys where they do not feel smart and they do not do intelligent things and they get low grades or they struggle with understanding or they have difficulty communicating with their peers. There's going to be a lot. They're going to get depressed when they're teenagers. They're going to they're going to go inwards and they're going to reevaluate themselves and they're going to push away authoritarian structures 
that is part of them solidifying their identity. And it is so important for us to always keep this frame, this lens on our eyes. Our children are Sat Chit Ananda, and they're very close to realizing that, having been born in aristocratic, transcendental families, the Bhagavad Gita, the main scripture of the Vedas, explains that our children, the children who are born in an aristocratic home, so aristocracy basically if you look at the world's population of six billion individuals anyone who has running hot water lives in a nice house in north america or apartment or condo and has car is like at a level much higher than probably 80 percent of the population of the earth planet so i identify aristocracy at that level and transcendentalists if you're watching this it means you're familiar with the bhakti process you're familiar with rathyatra and you have perhaps attended a virtual um, not a non-virtual festival in the past so it means you've already taken up bhakti practices or are at least interested in bhakti pra practices and consider yourself a transcendentalist those who have taken birth in your home it is not a coincidence. They are already at that level of section two. Let's reframe the way we speak to them, the way we act with them, the way we interact with them. Let's see even their negative qualities, even their failings as just little blips, areas where they need to find challenges. And there's so much more we can delve into as far as how to do that. I'm just going to give you one small tip. And again, you can find more tips and sign up for my parenting and educating seminars and courses at gobigita.com. So the tip I'm going to give you is how to use blossoming words. All right. So we talked about how we're going to reframe. And this is something you can do right away. You know, as a mom and as a dad, we've had to see our children from the moment that they were in our womb when they were kicking us. And then we've ha we had to go through like, you know, hours of labor. I don't know if your labor was easy or hard, but we've had to like really go through an incredible transformation to have these beautiful children that we are with. And then the first year and two and three are some of the most amazingly difficult years ever because you're teaching your child from scratch how to behave, how to eat, how to poop, how to clean up after yourself, how to put your clothes on. And it's all such an endeavor where you're continuously having to fix them, fix the way you are. And so the mind creates this whole environment of always seeing something wrong. We're going to change that. Nothing is wrong. They are exactly where they need to be in their development because intrinsically they are Sat Chit Ananda. And we are meant as educators, as teachers, as parents, only to bring out what is automatically already within our students and our children. Education is not meant to fix or control or change our children stuff something in them that's an external education is meant to bring out what is already within and so how are we going to do that instead of recognizing all of the things that go wrong and i have to remind myself of this pretty frequently i have an 18 year old now and a 16 year old he just turned 16 and i've had 18 years of remembering this and training others regularly to remember this instead of always looking for that which needs to be fixed instead of always noticing the negative and how many times you notice the negative your child does the dishes and it's time to clean the sink and you see that they have done all the dishes and they did as much as they could but there's still that little guck inside of the drain you know stuck right there and it's full of food and as you walk in the kitchen the first thing you say you don't notice all the pots that are neatly stacked up that have been cleaned the first thing you notice is the guck in the drain that hasn't been emptied out or you'll go and notice oh there's still some soap suds on these pots like oh my god he did the dishes i have to redo them 
It happens automatically. You've asked your child to bring the groceries in, and as he goes to the car to bring the groceries in and comes back, he leaves the door open. And you're watching as your young, beautiful boy rushes off to get the groceries, but you start noticing all the flies. And in Texas here, we have mosquitoes that are coming in as the child is, why is it that we're noticing that? Let's notice the opposite. So let's not just notice the sat, chit, ananda, and jivarasvarupoi, krishner, nityadas. Let's not just notice how our kids are happy, how they are intelligent, how they have a vitality for life in active, active service. Let's not just notice it. Yes, we need to notice it. We need to do what that rookie professor did to section two. We need to change the way we look at our kids, but we need to start verbalizing it. If we verbalize it, we're increasing our confidence in their abilities, and we're increasing their confidence in their abilities and their identity. And so how are we going to notice this? Hey, instead of thinking, stop your mind. Thank you. I noticed that you brought the groceries in. That shows me you're so responsible and so helpful. We don't need to increase our children's and students' ego. So I'm not saying that we're going to constantly, consistently praise our children. No, that is not helpful because then they'll always be looking for that praise. We're going to notice an action and place a quality next to it. Now, this is a more in-depth uh, part of my course and uh, my syllabus, exactly how you do this, what phrases are better, in what environments you can use this in, how you can actually turn around difficult behavior in a classroom by these blossoming words. But just really simply here, we're going to notice something that they did and put a positive quality to it. Okay, so for the example of the child who's doing the dishes, I noticed you did all the, the, the dishes that shows me of such a service attitude. I noticed you helped me carry the groceries in. It shows me that you like to help, you're so helpful. I noticed that you helped your brother when he was upset. It shows me that you intrinsically love to give your happiness to others. I noticed that even though you were upset, and you were really upset about that situation that happened that was so natural, you were able to get past it and get through it and you wiped your tears and you moved on. That shows me you're intrinsically happy. All right, we're going to notice what we want them to become because they already are that and much more. And we're going to remind ourselves and remind them how they are. And we're going to stand against any negative words. All right, so that's my little talk for today. And if you want more, please do um, send me, check out my website, www.gopigita.com. That's G-O-P-I-G-I-T-A.com. There's an educate section, there's a parent section, there's a lot more videos there where you can get some tips and blogs to read. And if you're interested in signing up for a three-day parenting course, hit me up and let me know. All righty. We will see you later. Have a wonderful rest of your Toronto Festival of India um, journey and enjoy all the kirtans that they've lined up for us to listen to. Hare Krishna.